Hey everybody, Josh Yon Miller, and we're here with our new Whiteboard Wednesday. Well, it's not new, right? It's been gone for a while, but this week's, this week's Whiteboard Wednesday. And if you're watching a recording, I don't know, somewhere in my future, that's going to seem a little odd, but I record these things live for, uh, for folks that uh, could jump on. So anyway, um, you know, I was going to say that we were doing things, you know, today to kind of get ready for street readiness. But if you know me and you've been training with me for any length of time or following me, you know that everything's about street readiness uh, and not just uh, duplicating things from 13th century, 15th century Japan. Okay, nothing wrong with that stuff. Nothing wrong with that stuff. As a matter of fact, I remember having a conversation with um, one of my teachers a bunch of years back and uh, it's kind of an open Q&A. And I said, you know, I, I really make sure that my students have street readiness stuff up front. Right. And then at a certain point, we start diving into and looking at the historical things because I don't want to, I don't want to get, I don't want them to get caught up in uh, stuff that, you know, because all that old stuff. It is not just that it's old, right? But nobody's throwing a jab at your face. Nobody's throwing an uppercut, right? The, the knife attacks and things like that are different. And we want to make sure that things are ready today, you know? And he looked at me and said, that's absolutely right. I absolutely believe that students at, definitely need to get that stuff, right? But my job as a teacher at this position in this art is to faithfully pass on things. Uh, so when you come to these seminars uh, with me, that's my role, right? So we're covering you know, Kukishinden, Gyoko Ryu, whatever, from, from that historical context, right? So um, I think people can get lost in that, right? Another quick story. Uh, I remember one time um, I had uh, was promoting this one book that I uh, had put out. I think it was called The Karate Myth. I think that's the one it was. Either way, right? And uh, this guy contacts me and he said, hey, have you ever thought about rewriting this book? This book is awesome, but have you ever thought about rewriting it for Nijitsu or Bujinkan practitioners. And this is literally what my brain did. Okay. Now we weren't face to face, but. Okay. And I said, it, it is right. It just doesn't have any of the Japanese terminology. Right. And he said, ah, yeah, I know, but um, I, I, you know, I think I'm just going to follow the traditional stuff and, uh, and do my street self-defense that way. I just do like the Madagascar. Right. I've been watching that with my little three-year-old grandson. Right, it just kind of reminds me of these lines. Right, uh, little penguins. Right, just smile and wave, boys. Just smile and wave. I'm not here to re-educate the masses, but either way, uh, in a previous uh, video, we took a look at this uh, this concept of a. I, I kind of created this framework. Right, um, I call it zero point. Right, and so what? Uh, there, there's a whole worksheet that my students get, and they work through this stuff. Right. But the zero point concept, right, is based on the fact that anytime you're given a technique, historical, hanka, modern variation, whatever, let's pick one. Let's, uh, I don't know, I'm just going to pull one out of my, my uh, ninja teacher butt, right? Let's, uh, let's say we're doing shihaku. Doesn't matter if you know it, don't know it, right? It's a koto ryu, uh, shoden no makikata, it doesn't matter, right? But what this is, is, the reality and the understanding that to be able to do this technique correctly, right? Okay. There's a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of kihon no kihon uh, and, and skills and, and abilities and fitness and whatever that we have to be able to do, right? Level of understanding and whatnot to be able to recreate that kata correctly, right? One of the biggest problems that I see is that people are given a technique. And I, again, I don't care if it's a Henka. I don't care if it has an official name. I don't care if it's Joe, Billy Bob. I, I don't care what it, what it is, but they're given a technique. They learn the technique step-by-step step to where they're able to do it. Let's say eight, nine out of 10 times, every time they do it works well. Right. And then they automatically think that, okay, got it. That one's ready for the street. See, we have to understand the difference between the different levels of, of training, right? The different uh, transmission levels, right? When, when we're doing these things, typically we're on one line, right? Isen, we're on one line, right? And he's coming in with a very specific type of attack, right? We're not talking about any kind of variation yet, right? We're still in the shoot stage, right? Copy, preserve, right? So he's throwing a very specific type of attack. I'm going to move to a very specific angle based on that, right? 
we have, we're not even getting into the hot stage for breaking it and starting to create variation or anything like that, right? So everything from come eye to footwork to weight transition to the counter strike to the timing of the strike or the timing of the, fo- the, the footwork to the Tai Sabaki to the – and again, I'm not listing all these because there might be 15, there might be 20. What, it doesn't matter, right? But there's all these. For me to be able to do this kata correctly, right? This is where people start tuning out because, well, shit, sensei, that's a lot of work. Right. Or th- there's the group that goes, well, yeah, of course, there's a lot of work in being able to get this right. Yeah. This is all the stuff. Once I have the base model, this is all the stuff that I'm going to need to do. And again, we can throw stuff in here, whatever. Varying types of attacks, environment, clothing types, uh, different, uh, different types of timing, uh, whatever. Right. Uh, and that's not a hoe, that's a plus 10. <laughs> okay, so I even throw myself off my own writing, right? But this is all the stuff I have to do to be able to get to this point where plus 10 is street ready. Okay, so it's just, what the hell do I do with my eraser? <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, I got some strange allergies going on here. All right. So, um, again, you know, you can dig out that other that other uh, video. It's on my YouTube channel. Right. Uh, Zero point defense or zero point framework or I don't know. Look for zero point. Right. So but what I want to take a look at today are these five. Actually, I I can't. I popped the sixth one in my head as I was writing things out to make sure I miss anything. Right. So we'll give you a bonus one as well if you stay to the end. But uh, so five keys or five, uh, I'm going to use the word secret because these t- things tend to show up in the, in the makimono, right? Um, where they're, they're considered to be secrets, right? And they're secrets because they're hidden. They're not obvious, right? You need to ferret these things out. Or once you get to a certain level and you're a certain type of student, then your teacher can go, hey, watch for this, okay? Everybody wants to be able to plunk down their money because, you know, we're in the Western world, right? I paid for that. You don't, I don't want you lying to me, tricking me. I want you to hand it to me on a silver platter like I just pulled up at the drive through window. But they also still want to do a traditional martial art where everything is done traditionally. Anyway, all right. So uh, what I want to take a look at is this idea of how to always have the right technique at the right time in any given situation. Okay. Now, any and all and never and always and those kind of things. I'm not a big fan of these things, but right, people want to know, how will I know? How do I know which technique? How do I know? I get these questions all the time, right? So uh, this actually plays into something. I think it comes from the Tagagi Yoshi Ryu. In their scrolls, there's this secret. There was well, a bunch of secrets all over the place, right? But there's a secret for always knowing the right technique to do. Okay. Would you like to know it? Okay. Some of you probably already know it because you've been around me forever. Right. But the secret is never do a technique that's not already working. See, now you just feel cheated, don't you? Okay. But that points to ego's desire to do something it wants to do regardless of what's going on. Okay. If we were going to stop there, what would we have? Right. What I'm going to point out today, these these things for actually living to this ideal, right? Getting to this point, right? So we'll start with those five, right? And then I'll toss that bonus one in as we go, right? Okay. So five key elements, five secrets, whatever, whatever trips your trigger floats your boat, whatever, right? Okay. So the first, the first key element, right, is knowing how to do the technique. We know that, right? Okay, or do we? Okay, because it's been my experience also, and I I fell prey to this as well when I was coming up through the ranks, right? Wanted to jump to Henko, wanted to jump to variation, wanted to feel like I was in the in the in the thick of things, right? But I couldn't even tra- transfer my balance right to get to the foot, so that the next move wasn't so herky jerky and all that kind of stuff, right? But we want to feel like we're fighting, right? Um, one of my teachers used to always say that um, most people don't want to. Um, they don't want to 
work through personal development. They don't want to work on mastery or whatever, right? They want to do something that's akin to going to the amusement park for the day, right? They want to have their martial arts experience. They want to have their personal development experience, but they don't want to go through all the hard work, right? That's why the key words that, that we all use very often, right, is quick and easy because most people want quick and easy, right? They don't want guaranteed because you know what? Guaranteed, it's boring, takes a long time, and it's it's painful. It's People want quick and easy, right? You could just give me a pill. My, my mom said this one time at a doctor's office. Take her to the doctor. She's not doing what she's supposed to be doing, right? As a matter of fact, she wants another crutch, not a crutch, right? She wants one, another one of these little devices. So she doesn't have to get up off her butt and take a couple of steps just to go to the restroom or the shower or whatever, right? And so body's starting to fall apart, right? Like, <laughs> Doctor and I ended up looking at each other after she said this. Doctor said, you got to, you have to, you have to, you have to. And my mom goes, yeah, 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 I know. But isn't it just a pill that you can give me? How, that's no different from people that want to learn this stuff, right? So knowing how to do the technique, it has to be a place to start, right? But let's move on to number two. Knowing what the technique feels like. Not done yet. Knowing what the technique feels like. I know. You sign on to these things and I got sloppy ass writing. I, you, you wish I just typed the stuff out. Oh, well, you got to put up with it, right? So knowing what the technique feels like when it's working. Okay? Most people stop at step by step. And then they can't figure out why it works sometimes, doesn't work sometimes, or whatever, right? What does the technique feel like when it's working? Okay. Number three. Actually, let's make this nice and short. Knowing what the technique feels like when it's not working. What's it feel like when it's not working? Because you know what? You have microseconds to get this right. Okay? The average punch travels from the time the person initiates the movement to the time it hits the target about 200 milliseconds, less than a quarter of a second. Right? A, fast is, a fight is blazingly fast. The average self-defense situation is over in two to ten seconds, not two to five-minute rounds like you find in martial arts tournaments, MMA, whatever. So people can take their uh, you know, oxygen, uh, you know, whatever, the O2 stuff they're monitoring and all that, and they can shove it right up their ass because the fight's going to be over in the amount of time it takes for the glycogen to burn out of your muscles, and that's 7 to 11 seconds. Done. If it's not done by then, four moves or less, 10 seconds or less, you start to lose big time, right? And we're not talking about a slugfest like a high school fight and stuff like that. We're talking about somebody trying to beat, break, or kill you, right? You're either going to the ER, you're going to the morgue, or you're going to the jail, the jail cell, right? So know how to do it. Know what it feels like when it's working. This is left brain. This is right brain. This is right brain. 99.8% of students stay in left brain training, right? The irony is that we use the left brain for training, but we use the left brain to guide the training so the shit gets in right brain, Okay subconscious, unconscious levels, right? Into muscle memory, all that kind of stuff so that we can do it intuitively. And we, so we can do it at the speed of a fight, not the speed of training or soft training in the dojo. It's not the way it works, okay? I mean, everybody has a good time with that, but anyway, right? So know how it works, know what it feels like when it's working, know what it feels like when it's not working, right? Being able, <coughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> asthma. Oh. All right. So uh, knowing the physical setup. Knowing the physical setup. This is not the same as this. This is not the step-by-step -step moves. Okay. Uh, one of the things that my uh, candidates for first degree black belt have to be able to do is recognize the physical setup for their techniques. Right. So if I'm in any given position, right, 
based on feel, based on sight and whatnot, I need to know, I need them to know what technique options I have from right here, my body relative to his body. This goes to the koto use kudai dori, right? Being able to catch that space, catch that moment, right? Being able to, to feel where you are. We've got a video coming up or uh, one of these Whiteboard Wednesdays uh, in a couple of weeks on the koto you. Actually, I think it's a two-part one because it's so damn uh, long, right? Um, on this whole idea of kudai dori, right? So knowing the physical setup, what I mean by that is, and I don't have a partner here with me or whatever, so, but if somebody grabs right here, right, they grab my sleeve and I shift back to kind of ride that off and my elbow is on the outside of their arm, right, I know that I don't have a mushadori, right, I may have an onikudaki, I may have a couple of other things, I may be able to drop this under and move into something else or whatever, but I need to know what I have. I need to know what my options are at a glance because I know what the setup is. See, and I think we did one of the earliest whiteboard Wednesdays. We broke a, a technique down into three parts, right? With the entering, with the actual execution of the technique, and then we had the follow-up or the, uh, the recovery at the end of it, right? Everybody wants to focus on either the, the doing the do, right? Because that makes you the man or the woman or whatever, right? Okay. But they ignore or they, they pay attention to the whole model, like it's the whole technique. But the model has entering, it has an execution phase, and it has a recovery phase or a trapping or whatever phase, right? Okay. So and most people ignore the entry phase, not that they don't do it. They just don't freaking pay attention, because he's going to punch, he's going to punch, and then I get to do... <gasps> And I get to feel all warm and fuzzy about myself. Okay. It's during those entry phases, right? So if we're doing uh, shihaku, which is what I wrote up here originally, in the it's a kotoryu uh, uh, technique, right? Um, at the very beginning, right, right? There's two punches that are thrown in the kata. It's not about two punches. It could be one punch and you catch him. It could be two punches like the kata says. It could be three. It could be five. It could be you did something else. He recovered. Here he comes again. Or you took him down. Here comes his friend. Right? Whatever. Okay. So, but I need to know what the physical setup, what's the physical setup to allow me to do Ganseki Nage as easily as, as easily as possible to do Omote Gyaku, to do Ure Gyaku, to do all these kind of things, right? How do I know that this is a good option where I'm not in my own way that I can do it just like that, right? It's, it's not, right? It's, it's not a, it's not going to be a struggle. I'm not going to get stuck in here. I'm not going to get tied up with this guy. Okay. That's where we go back to looking at Sanshin for penetration. We start looking at uh, Kiona Bo from the perspective of energy conservation, right? We, we pay better attention to our Tai Sabaki, right? Our body management, which also re relies on Ashi Sabaki, right? Most people say footwork, but it's leg management, right? But Tai Sabaki, all in all, in all is not just evasion, right? Tai Sabaki is about getting offline of the attack, but being lined up in a way where all your targets are closed and all his targets are open, okay? So... And Taisabaki for any given technique, like Ganseki or something like that, is going to look different for a newbie, right? Or somebody in our curriculum under second Don, right? Because you're just trying to not die, right? So I recognize what I have. That's why for Shodan, they have to be able to recognize it. That way, um, when we're sitting up there at the testing board and somebody goes to, to uh, put a technique on, even if they have to muscle a little bit, right? Um, I'm okay with that for first Don because they recognize that that was a viable option. They, their taijutsu might still be a little rough around the edges, right? But it was a viable option. Now, if they go to do something that gets them stuck, trapped, the, the, their uke reverses it on them or whatever, and that was not, that wasn't even in the wheelhouse because we're over here sitting, we're not just gauging their performance, we're gauging their decision-making as well, right? Now, that's us, okay? That's us. If your teachers do things differently or whatever, I'm not here to, to, to convince, convince anybody to do anything anyway. That's, that's not my thing, right? So anyway, right, knowing the physical setup, our setup, and then number five is recognizing the physical setup, recognizing by feel. The setup happening.
you don't have time to think about, oh, his arm's coming in here. He's breaking my balance. I got to do – your left brain is too slow for this. It's too slow, right? You need to be able to recognize by feel, okay? Uh, quick story. Some of you guys may have already heard this uh, this one, but uh, I was a military policeman, United States Army, way back in the in the counterterrorism days, Cold War days or whatnot. What yep, I'm that old, right? So we're talking mid to late 80s. I'm stationed in what was then West Germany. So it had to be mid, right? Because uh, the wall dropped at a certain point. Anyway, so um, uh, we get called to this unit because this guy is yelling racist stuff and he's just going nuts. And yeah, you know, so my partner and I get there and this guy comes busting in this door and he's just enraged, right? And we're trying to get the story out of him and him, you know, it's the this against that and that, that, that. And he's drunk off his ass and whatever, right? The guy's a bodybuilder, right? I was much, much thinner in my days. I mean, I, I maybe topped out at, at that point at about 135, 136, right? And I'm five, six and change, which means that I got into the military police corps on a waiver because they were short on MPs because the minimum height requirement in the United States Army for an MP is 5'8". So my nickname very often was walking small. If you know the movies, you understand the switch. Anyway, so he's quite a bit taller than me, but he's a weightlifter. And I mean a power lifter. So he's, he's built, right? And so I'm trying to calm this guy down. He starts to manipulate around, makes a couple of comments. I'm trying to neutralize things. And the next thing you know, this guy cut, leads off with an uppercut that comes up and catches me in the chin that I had to write off. And next thing I know, he's just hammering in, right, with these things. And I'm just in a hoko gu guiding and guarding, right, and just trying to not get my skull slammed by these, these, these you know, boulder-like freaking fists that are coming in, right? And all of a sudden, I felt things happening and my body knowing what that feels like my body just felt things happening and i felt my body shift into this mushadori right catching him this way right all i remember thinking there was this flash of left brain thought that was like hey i know that one zip this on him laid him out on his back turned it into a different joint lock to roll him over onto his stomach so we can get him in the cuffs and that was a day right Oh, meanwhile, there's this duty officer who my hands are up, right? And I'm sure from his perspective, maybe it looked like I was hitting too because my hands were up and near his face and whatnot. But I'm in this position. He's the one punching. And this guy's screaming at me from next to me, yelling, stop hitting him, stop hitting him, stop hitting him. And I remember in the mix of it, I looked at him and said, I'm not hitting him, right? So all this shit's going on. I don't have time to feel, I don't have time to do what we do in class where I'll teach people how, you know, punch comes in and then as the guy retracts, we're going to follow that, right, to catch him instead of just doing it like stage one where we're going to wrap our arm around his and catch this thing and whatnot, right? I need to let him do at least half the work, right? Anyway, oh, by the way, at that point, right, I was, uh, let's see, 6Q, right? So I was four levels from first degree black belt. Because my teachers made us do a lot of this training in drill form so we could get the basics ingrained into muscle memory and not just train for entertainment's sake, right? Or to feel like we're doing something, right? So anyway, um, again, it has to, you, have to, you have to be able to recognize by feel, right? And not talking to yourself and all that wonderful stuff, right? So again, five key points. Knowing how to, to do the technique, obviously, right, and do it correctly where you're on balance, you're not stumbling, you've got range of motion, angles right, all that kind of stuff, right? That zero point, the technique, right, that way. I need to know what the technique feels like when it's working. What does an onikudaki feel like when I'm touching him? All I have is upper arm and lower arm, but what do I feel, right? When it's working, what do I feel when that... AC joint is being compromised and the scapula is tilting under and snagging into the ribs, right? What's that feel like? Okay. What's it feel like when it's not working? Okay. We're going to come back to these two in just a minute. What's it feel, especially this one? What's it feel like when it's not working? Because there is nothing worse. I know it causes basic frustration um, for, for a lot of people because they're trying to learn the technique, right? But no, no greater frustration than, you know, you have it, you have it, you have it, and then you lost it, 
and uh, you know, you got that dojo frustration kind of thing. Yeah. There's no greater frustration than thinking you have something and losing it when somebody's trying to beat, break or kill you. Okay. Whatever frustration you think goes on in the dojo, that ain't it. Okay. And if that's what you think is it, then I don't know. I'm not going to say that you probably pee yourself when somebody steals your Cheerios, but who knows? Anyway, right? I know. Sensei's a dick. I get it. All right? Anyway, all right. So number four, knowing the physical setup. How does my body have to be aligned with his body to enter to do that next piece, to do each piece of the kata? What I what was beaten into me early on was you need to earn every move in the kata. Right? And you need to be moving and positioning yourself so that your brain feels like, well, duh, that's the option. Right? It's, it's what I have. Okay? But you need to earn every one, just like in a fight. Everything you get, every evasion, every counter, every hit, every lock, you need to earn it. Because nobody in this freaking world, nobody on this planet, right, except for your training partner, is going to let you do this shit to them. No one. Remember, he's trying to beat, break, or kill you. He's not going to let you just do it to him. He's not an uke. He's a techie. Uke is a receiver. Uke, when, you're, when your training partner is in the role of uke, his job is to help you be successful so you can understand the technique and learn it at a certain level. And he can practice taking ukemi at a certain level. As you start moving up, your partner stops being an uke and they start being a techie, which means they will resist, they will counter, they will disengage, they will do all that kind of stuff. So... If you miss it, you miss it, right? You need to earn it, okay? When you can do this stuff to somebody who knows what you're doing and can counter it, and you can catch them, you 99.8% of the people out there don't stand a chance. Well, let's be conservative, 99.6%. Anyway, all right, so we have all these, right? Physical setup, recognizing by feel the setup happening, just like I did with that, that Musha Dori, right? guarding and this guy's arm because they're just his friggin' upper arms were as big as my thighs at that time right this guy was jacked right and he was under the influence of uh, a certain chemical from lynchburg tennessee if you know what i'm talking about right so anyway it's coming in and i, I caught him on this side I caught him on uh, his left side so in the midst of all that punching his arm is pulling back and it ended up snagging my arm just like we do in the training drills and then uh, as soon as my brain went, oh, I know this, right? Then it was just a matter of rotating and turning my body weight because there was no way I was going to take the arms that I had back then against this guy's arms and muscle a mushadori on him, right? When I say knowing how to do the technique, I mean like with a mushadori or an onikudaki or whatever, knowing that it's your body weight or a gansaki, knowing it's that your body weight moving into the lower part of the limb, Right? not fighting the big muscles, okay? That's what I mean, right? So recognizing by feel the, the setup happening, okay? Let's do that bonus one. Then I'll send you back into your lives, citizen. You're on a video. You can rewind. Come on. Seriously? I'm not finished writing, sensei. Yeah. How do I hear some of you say that across the void? Because everybody's looking for the teacher to hand out the gold stars and to give them the answers for the test and all that. How do I know that? Because I went through Western academic freaking school too. Okay. And let's see. Dun, 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 the bonus. Bonus lesson. Okay. The bonus is knowing what the technique, or I'm sorry, knowing what. Okay. Knowing what techniques putting an S on that one, knowing what techniques <coughs> are connected okay, are connected to the technique you're trying to do, right? So I'm just going to put it, right? To it uh, if it fails. If you're not training for the possibility of your techniques failing, then you got some crack smoke and delusion going on because no technique is guaranteed. Okay. Zero. Right. But your bonus is knowing what techniques are connected. We did a video. I thought these things are starting to get interconnected. Right. We did one on the Gilco to use three and one, one and three principle. 
And so what we're, gonna, what we're taking a look at was, was um, uh, you know, like Omote Gyaku principle, right? Long range out here. And then mid range is this technique and Mushadori and uh, Osoto Nage was very close range and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and, and another one coming up, it was actually scheduled for, for this one, but I wasn't feeling it, right? So we're going to do this thing called throw flow, which is actually spread across two or three Don levels in our lower black belt stages, pre, pre-fifth Don, where they have to be able to first go from any lock holder throw that's failing into one that's happening, right? Again, remember the Tagagi Ocean uh, lesson? Never do a technique that's not already working, Okay. So I start to do, let's say I start to do, um, uh, let's say I start to do Ganseki, right? I get this guy's arm out in position, right? Ganseki is just a lateral arm bar throw, right? So elbow is supposed to be crook of the elbow or the, the knob of the elbow goes that way, right? So I'm catching him to catch that shoulder joint, tossing him this way. And as I'm getting it, he rotates his thumb down. So now the, the elbow is up. Right. And I could catch it if it starts to wrap, if I have him far enough. But often what will happen is and this is a, this is an escape that we teach people uh, for third degree. Right. They roll that thing over and then they punch forward to end up in a different place and it unbalances him. And then you can uh, kind of, it's all kinds of cool stuff. Anyway, so um, I need to know that Ganseki is a lateral muso dori. Right. Muso dori, that arm bar this way. Right. So if he slips that, I just follow him. Right. I'm doing this. He slips it and I just back out and drop the weight down on top of the elbow because the joint is now up. Right. So I need to know on that side. Right. If I'm starting to get it right and I start to apply pressure here and he slips it this way. Right. Then I need to know what I have on the other side. Okay, so um, we start to play around with. When a technique fails which technique is currently happening or being created. Okay. One of the most, one of the most eye opening lessons I ever learned was that there's no failure for a ninja. There's no failure. If you failed, you're dead. Okay. One of the, one of the most common statements made in the dojo, whether it's classes or seminars or whatever um, with, with black belts and on our adaptability is people will go, man, there's always something. Yeah, if there isn't always something, you're dead. Okay, so one of the most eye-opening lessons I ever got was that any failing technique or any failed technique is actually the setup for something else. So don't marry yourself to the technique you're trying to do. Don't chain your or enslave yourself to a given technique. Make sure you're monitoring all the way through. What does it feel like when it's working? What does it feel like when it's not working? And the more this practice you do, you'll start to recognize, oh, when it's not working, it actually feels like, oh, well, shit, maybe it's that one. Okay? So there you go. Six of them instead of five. I lied, right? Okay? So uh, six key elements for always having the right technique at the right time, right? If you haven't already liked and subscribed, if you're on uh, YouTube, please make sure you subscribe to these things, right? That way you get notifications when things pop up and I throw uh, extra ones out, which I'm going to be doing a shit ton of here coming up, right? Uh, if you're on Facebook, you know how this stuff works. Like, share, fart in the web, whatever, right? So anyway, um, and if you can make it in for one of the seminars, uh, as we're doing this one, today is June 15th, right? So it's the uh, U.S. Army's birthday and a bunch of other stuff going on, right? So uh, uh, September 30th, October 1st, and 2nd of 2022, this year, right, uh, is our fall camp intensive, right? And what we're going to be doing during that camp is we're going to be taking the original, historical, traditional, I hate that word, traditional, uh, Ninja no Hachimon Eight Gates model and looking at it in the 21st century West, Western world, right, without losing the kotsu, without losing the essential nature. Everything that we put, everything that we swap out, and some of the things don't get swapped, right? Some of these things stay exactly as they are, okay? Hint, shuriken, spear, and uh, sword don't stay. That doesn't mean we don't practice with them, but they need to be replaced with something else that does the exact same thing. That is still a projectile weapon, an edged weapon, a bludgeoning weapon, or more importantly, a long range weapon, a, a, a 
mid-range weapon and a close-range weapon, right? We need to be able to swap these things out and understand how it all works, okay? Because if we take the same, for those people who only want to do it traditionally, right? If we look at the Ninja Hachimon and why it was put in place in ancient Japan, it was the litmus test, right? A school to be able to say that it was teaching ninjutsu had to be teaching, as a minimum, these eight areas. And if they weren't, well, then they weren't teaching ninjutsu, okay? You, I don't care if you're doing things that are ninja-like, but not the same, okay? Anyway, that's it. That's what I got. Hopefully, uh, you know, if you guys have any comments, uh, whatever, right, you can always post them down below. Uh, let me know what your big aha moment was. Uh, if there's any topics you would like for me to uh, cover, you can always submit those things as well. Uh, don't forget, Monday evenings, 8 p.m. Eastern, we've got our weekly Kuden uh, radio, our podcast, right, where we go into a whole bunch more things on personal development side and, and all that. Right. I know I disappoint people because they signed on expecting to see a whole bunch of cool physical skills. But you know what? There's more to warriorship, more to ninjutsu, more to all of this than just fighting. OK, that's it. All right. I'll talk to you next time. Be safe. And well, I was going to say train hard, but you know what? That's entirely up to you. I'll talk to you soon. Bye bye.